Blitz is defined as a sudden, savage attack. It is indeed all this. The effect is sure. The premise is simple. It's a basic, primal confrontation, man to man. No excuses are offered. None except. Welcome to the latest edition of Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. Looks like a radio station. Now, here are your hosts, Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers. Pure athlete, yeah. I transcend race, hombre. Matt Butler. I don't talk <laughs> man. I back it up. And we are chock full of that, man. Damn right. And Jeff Howe. It's still real to me, damn it. <laughs> and that's the bottom line, because Stone Cold said so. If you're going to blitz, come strong, but don't come at all. We are coming strong after Texas came strong with it in one heck of a football game. But unfortunately, the Longhorns were on the short end of it. LSU beats Texas 45-38, an instant classic in DKR on Saturday. Gentlemen, I don't know if this lived up to the hype. It it exceeded it in some ways. Uh, Again, this is a fantastic game, but we'll break it down how and why Texas fell short. And, yeah, even though nobody really wants to talk about it, we will look ahead to Rice because Texas <laughs> does play Rice <laughs> this weekend. Hey, They'll like get a few minutes on the Blitz. Saturday, 7 o'clock, a few minutes. NRG Stadium, Rod's old stomping grounds. Rod, when you were in the NFL, did you ever get a chance to play at uh, Reliant slash NRG Stadium? I'm not sure if I did, actually. I took some pictures there or something for like a promotion, but I don't know if I ever played there. You uh, had uh, – the for the, the the fortunate opportunity slash unfortunate opportunity of playing in the old Astrodome, which was great, yeah, great Astrodome. venue, but yeah, but it, it it shortened some careers. That's that's for damn show. Yeah. You're playing on that <laughs> carpet it's on funny top of concrete. You go from uh, the, a wonder of the world. Yeah. So within two decades, it's like, uh, oh, that's actually dangerous for you to be. Yeah. yeah to be playing on that surface. Yeah. So, speaking of dangers, we've got air conditioner gate. Did LSU have air conditioning in their dressing room? Did they not have it? Was somebody's it? lying. Yeah. Somebody's not telling the mm. somebody's not telling the complete truth. Yes. Somebody's telling the half truth or is. something. There's truthiness going yes. on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we can get into that. We can get into that, but we will uh, be discussing uh, the meat and potatoes of what happened on the field. I am Jeff Howe. Let me bring in the rest of the team. He is the master of the soundboard, the drop machine extraordinaire, Matt Butler. How are you, sir? Doing pretty well, man. How about yourself? I'm terrific. And lifetime Longhorn 2002 UT All-American 2002 semifinalist for the Jim Thorpe Award. Fourth-round draft choice of the New York Giants back in 2003. Spent his NFL career with the Giants, Lions, Bears, Bucks, Broncos, and a year with the Hamilton Tiger Cats of the CFL. When he was done with football, Got himself back to Austin, Texas, and the 40 Acres, where he earned his degree. He is a card-carrying member of DBU, and when you get that All-American honor recognized by the NCAA, you're a black card member. Number 21 in your program, number one in your hearts, Mr. Rod Baberson. Thanks for the intro, brother. Uh, Rod, Rod, DBU is an appropriate place to start with this game because (laughs) not a lot of pass defense being played in this one. We took a hit this weekend. And both, by the way, both DBUs. I think it's that's but we took the L. We took the L. We took two L's. We took the loss to DBU and the actual. And I believe I believe the stat is correct. Joe Burrow's 471 yards, the most passing yards allowed by Texas in a home game. Uh, yes, yes, it is the greatest quarterback performance by an opposing quarterback in DKR in the history of DKR, I believe. And that's saying you something. You could argue that I'm sure. I'm sure a passer rating. You no, but that's saying but, something because yeah, since I've been on that, yeah. since I've been on the beat, uh, 2012 was my first year on the beat full time, and the guys that yeah. are coming to DKR, we've seen, we've seen Geno Smith. Seen some good ones now. We've seen Patrick Mahomes. Yeah, we've seen Jared Goff. Seen some good ones. Uh, yeah, some really good quarterbacks have come through. Yeah. You, and, uh, I mean, you want to you throw you want to throw Deshaun Kaiser in there? Yeah, one of no, I agree. He had a good Trayvon week. Boykin. It was looking at the numbers in you know Texas, we've covered it a lot the past decade. Quite struggle a lot of the struggles for the Longhorns. But you look back at the last time something like this happened, where Texas gave up that many yards, actually was in 08, and this game just so much reminded me of that 08. Texas Oklahoma game. It's just what would happen if you end up being on the losing end of one of those games. Yeah, this, this game. Rod, we talked about this on the Rodcast, and let's get into it from this standpoint. This game reminded me a lot of the Big 12 championship game. Just from the standpoint of we didn't see a ton of offensive creativity from Tom Herman. Uh, you, uh, our first 15 plays, the the script, which is usually Outside your of the script, script, the Outside opening of the script. script. I would say the first 15 plays were the most creative and innovative 
uh, what kind of segment of offensive plays of the game. Other than that, I'm going to agree with you for the most part. Second half was solid, but yeah, I think that low between the 15 and the second half, that was really the problem where you fall behind and had a couple series that you questioned a few situations, but then it also seemed at least coming out of half, they understood what was working, what wasn't, and started but to those are that adjustments, home. but not innovation and Agreed, creativity. Right. That's Agreed. the difference. They made adjustments. I'm not saying they didn't make adjustments. Right. They made adjustments while you saw a lot of the deep ball. Yep. But creativity, innovation, schematic advantage, didn't see a lot of that. I saw adjustments, but not schematic advantage. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and, Be specific, and being specific here, yeah. And then defensively, we'll get into it. To me, it felt, especially in the second half, like Todd Orlando was kind of grasping at straws. And, it was different from the Big 12 championship game from his standpoint because he went into that with a pick your poison. I'm going to make Oklahoma beat me death by a thousand paper cuts rather than yep. I don't want to let Kyler Murray get loose for another 60-something yard touchdown like he did when he brought Oklahoma back from 21 down in the fourth quarter in the regular season game. But Rod, it, it, where I draw the parallel with the Big 12 championship game, it felt like it almost felt like the coaching staff approached this, and I could be dead wrong on this, it felt like the coaching staff approached this game almost like they're playing with house money, saying, you know what, we'll just try to see if we can match up with LSU athlete for athlete and let the chips fall where they may. I, I think the best example of, and, you know, obviously that would be a conspiracy theory, but I'll step out on the grassy knoll with you because Colin Johnson, to me, may be the perfect example, right? Colin Johnson is your premier wide receiver, and we know we'll talk about Devin Duvernay because he deserves some some credit. Right. And he deserves us. Yeah, you know, I think Absolutely. everybody's excited to talk about Devin Duvernay. Made himself a ton and, of money. Yeah, and him and him taking his game to the next level. But Colin Johnson's supposed to be your guy. All the mock drafts say he's a, a first round pick. All this kind of stuff, and yet he doesn't get a catch until midway through the third quarter. And we actually mocked uh, Skip Holtz in Louisiana Tech for allowing their premier wide receiver, Adrian yeah. Hardy, to go the entire first half without having a catch. And I got to go back and track it. I heard, think I heard Brian Davis of the Austin American Statesman say he believes that Colin Johnson only had one target in the first half. And I got to go back and track the targets. But you know, it, it, that's the case then. That is on the coaches. So my point is, getting back to the schematic advantage you should be able to find a way to get him open. Now, I know that sounds crazy because you're going against LSU and he's a big-time wide receiver, and, hey, man, you got to find a way to create separation on your own. But you can put him in bunch formations. You can put him in motion. You can put him flexed right off the um, – you know, remember, remember that long – oh, man, it was kind of a long, deep drag route that LSU – completed uh-huh. uh where they basically started the receiver who was a flex on the opposite side of the formation Built into their ran them all the way across the field and they basically completed on the opposite sideline there mm-hmm. and crossers. texas lost track of them on the initial part of the formation and on the back side of them they were too late to keep track of them you could do that with Colin Johnson all day. Yes. Just drag his 6'6 six, six behind across the field. And nobody, you can almost just toss it up and let it be a rebounding play. I mean, watch Julio and Jones. That's what Shanahan they, did they, nonstop they, with they, him. They do it all the time in the league. Michael Thomas does yes. it all the time. My point being, there was no schematic. You didn't see schematically Texas go out of its way to get to force feed Colin Johnson the football. And to me, that goes back to kind of what you were saying. They were like, Colin Johnson, leave him out there. Hey. It doesn't matter. He's supposed to go out there and win. And that's great. He's supposed to win. But, you know, in this day and age, you know, it's working harder, not smarter. Yeah. <laughs> He's Colin Johnson. Do what you did in the Big 12 title game. Remember what they did in the Big 12 title game? They put him, like, at the – he was at the tip of, like, that triangle bunch mm-hmm. formation. They put him – they moved him inside, put him in the slot. Some the to number, that yeah, game. he's the number two receiver in formations. Like, yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? confusion. You, 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 you those first to, two and a half seconds of the pass where, say, Burrow beat you, those situations are when well, a guy like him is wide open. Though. Well, when they ran empty, you know, you motion a running back outside of him. Therefore, he's in the slot now, and then they have to adjust and then you got a lesser DB on him, not one of the corners. I don't know. I didn't see a lot of that. That's on Colin. But it's also on the coaches too, man. Yep. And we're going to criticize Skip Holtz for not getting his ace wide receiver the football. we got to do the same thing to Tom Herman and his staff right there. But we're being nitpicky. I know the offense did what they were supposed to do. But I'm just saying, you know, that's one of the things they could have done. And yeah. it was only, at least according to the game log, one target in the first half. And then right out of the half, <laughs> three targets in that first drive. So thereafter. they knew. That when they went to half they, they were embarrassed. Like, oh, damn, we only got one target? My our bad dog. Let's go out. Let's go out and get Colin Johnson. Before. So they knew they they knew that was wrong. Thanks, man. They they knew that was not cool. Like that's mm-hmm. a, that's like that's and it's why the, the commentators were bringing it up. Everybody was bringing it up. And by the way, they they threw sixteen deep balls that were twenty yards or more down the field in that game, which I think is the most that Sam Ellinger was ever thrown as a starting quarterback. Yep. And yet your premier deep threat didn't have 
a catch. At, on a deep ball, on a deep ball. Now. You know what I mean? Exactly. So my point is, and I know they were rolling coverage and all that, but that's on you. That means schematically they out-schemed you and out-coached you and took your best deep target out of the game when they knew you were, your adjustment was going to be to go deep on them when you went one-on-one coverage, and that's exactly what they did. And you pointing that out really does clarify another point in my mind about the schematic advantage in the first half because you would think at least, well, if Colin isn't being targeted, okay, well, they're pounding home Duvernay. Duvernay had 11 receptions for 142 yards in the second half. He only wow. had one reception for 12 yards in that first half. I didn't I did that either. A ton of daily fantasy and loaded up I on those two. I didn't realize that. At halftime, I thought I was going to get my ass kicked. I'm Ended up winning. Down. But, yeah, he had one reception in the wow. first half, had 11 for 142 you know how many targets in the he had in the first half? Uh, I'll look at it up real quick. Wow. But, yeah, still, to have that type of drastic nature. Now, it also means that LSU was doing a good job of keeping the ball in their offense's hands, not as many opportunities. And then you had the one drive. It was impressive with the Eagles on that touchdown. You could identify that no, Herman, Herman saw and they noticed saw the, the mismatch. They saw the weakness. Time to they it. saw what to exploit. And that's so one good it. thing. That's I a really, great adjustment. Yep. And but, it means that also now if Eagles can be the type of guy that actually seems that he can be a solid, top-tier, deep just threat, go win. it makes yeah. Colin in that role that you're speaking of that he should be in even more obvious. He yeah. sh- doesn't even have to be it's, the deep threat because you have somebody else that can like, stretch vertically. So his usage in the offense could definitely no, be I totally elevated. Agree I agree with that. I agree with that. If you look I'm at getting you, to Jeff's point, though, about the innovation and creativity, yeah, man. And I mean, I'm not knocking the staff. I'm no. just making an observation. I agree. Saying, I agree with that you know, observation, though. I didn't though. see a whole lot. I didn't either. It just, and I don't I don't blame Tom Herman for that. I mean, I, because it's a non-conference game, and I think it just kind of validates what he's saying. If you, depending on how much you want to put in a press conference quotes, Rod, it really seems like they approached it from the standpoint that, you know what, our, our best guys are good enough to compete with LSU. And yeah. honestly – if not for the it, uh, the unforgivable sin of the mm-hmm. football gods of being on the goal line and yeah. coming up twice, by the way, yeah. and coming away with zero points, you probably do beat LSU. I'm not trying yeah. to be you know Aggie here and you know and be you know getting to what you know lose things that it's losers realistic. say, but that's realistic. And that's honestly, I think all of us at one point, whether we want to admit it or not, I turned to my girlfriend when I was in the stadium and said it. Yeah. When we came away from the goal line on two occasions with zero points, I told her. We're going to pay for that. We said that's it after no the first way. time. Yeah. Then you got no the pick. Way. Then it looked like you had <laughs> intercepted. You're like, all right, we'll get it back. We got lucky. And then, yeah. There's, exactly. Yeah. Like the football. You like, earned like, it back with the Cowboy back. package, which we didn't see yeah. a ton of And again, that. you yeah. know, go back to the Big 12 championship game. There was a point in that first half where I think Texas is a 14-6, and they got a chance to really go for the throat and, and get a nice cushion on Oklahoma. Because like we say about Oklahoma, especially when Kyler Murray's running that offense, it's like the Golden State Warriors. You know they're going to make a run. It's just have you given yourself enough of a cushion that when they exactly. do make that run, yep. you still got the lead. Uh, and then that was the weird offensive drive where it started with like the the halfback pass by Keontae Ingram mm-hmm. and everything just kind of got reverse, on track. Yeah, and Oklahoma, reverse it, pass. it just it, yeah. it, you know it kind of felt like that where you're like, man, that was really your opportunity to really take control of the game. And, and that's and when you, you just missed. That's when it. you were looking for that. Okay, so give me that. Give me that wrinkle. Right, mm-hmm. give me give me that whatever you've been working on that you say specifically for this game, and you never really saw it. You no. saw the adjustment, like I said. You saw Sam start to become, you know, the transcendent Sam that we all knew on the big stage he was going to be. But you never saw that wrinkle that gave them as connective. I kept waiting on it to be the quarterback design running game. One of the things I predicted, right? Mm-hmm. So I looked at the quarterback design runs. There were eight quarterback design runs. Three of them outside the red zone. In the red zone, we know quarterback design runs coming all day, every day, and twice on Sunday. The three quarterback design runs outside the red zone, and you all, I think everybody kind of remembers them too. Mm-hmm. He got 37 yards on those three design runs, two first downs. Yeah. Well, I wanted more design runs, exotic design quarterback runs inside the 20s, and I didn't get that. Yep. I was waiting on I was like, oh, they're going to get something funky. Well, and man, we didn't get the weird. screen game all first half either. So the well, first half, first 15, you? first 15, you got yeah. remember the first play of the game? There's a great screen play, and you never see it again. Well, and that's the main Hell thing. Hell yeah. about Parker Braun on that screen. You so never if, see it again. And, and think like, about Whoa. this. Well, we're talking about also that the Ingram situation, he maybe isn't as in tune to that first half. So you have more of a reason to go yeah. to Ellinger with the run play or to go to Duvernay, yet, yet you don't, then when you look at the way that the gameplay played out, it actually sort of gives me, because, you know, Jeff was talking about how Texas wanted to go out there and see it's house money. Let's see if we can beat 
the opposing team in with LSU and the defense, it was like, well, actually, look at the targets. You were afraid to go to those top tier guys. You almost were letting the di- defense dictate it, and it psychologically is a situation where, yeah, you'll take what the defense is giving you if this mismatch. But then you're deducing your offense to your third or fourth or fifth best threat, and that's not necessarily what you want to do if you are really that true championship level point. top tier yeah. team. You are now letting the defense dictate it, and it sort of flips the script the way that. That you like to see the Texas defense does that to opposing offenses a lot. Well, the LSU defense did that to the Texas def- offense that's this a, time. That's a, gra- a very astute observation. I totally agree. They, uh, they forced you to go yeah. to your second, third, third fourth, options. Yes, all yeah. of them. I don't want to get too far into big picture because I do want to break down the game, but I think you're seeing at this point two things. One, how far this program has come under Tom Herman. That no question. It's not a surprise to see them compete in games like this anymore. It's awesome that 10 wins isn't which, a happy one for the fan base. Which, which by the way, I, I think this was probably the last one where I think Tom Herman gets the benefit of the doubt from the fan base and a loss. Like, the majority of Texas fans, I don't think, are upset by this loss. No, no, because we know you had a chance to win and even after all the, you know, the like I said, unforgivable sin in football of getting on the goal line twice and coming up with zero points and the defense playing, which we'll get into, basically just bad football a lot of the time. And Sam Ellinger, and I will say this, and I'm not trying to – listen, I love Sam Ellinger, but I'm not hating on him. He played like a B-plus game, yeah. and, and he was still transcendent. He was still all-time great. Yeah. That was a B-plus game. If you've been watching Sam, we all been watching Sam, that wasn't Sam's best. He started out a little – he was a little anxious, a little... just like Big 12, the Big 12 championship. He was a little anxious, so he overthrew guys early, and then he settled down and got himself real poised. So that's B-plus from Sam Ellinger. You get A-plus from Sam Ellinger, you beat LSU, and you probably beat him. You know, by a touchdown. And even and even <laughs> even all, all that said, if Colin Johnson's foot is oh. a foot <laughs> closer into the field, oh, then we we might be talking about a different game. Shout yeah. out to Dick of the kicker, baby. That was a beautiful. I I put him that Ooh, sequence right there where he hits kick, where he man. hits the field goal, and wow. then they they do the onside like that. I that was I, unbelievable. I put him in my top ten performers because of that because I can't remember the last time at Texas I saw an onside kick yep. executed. That or perfectly. Since, like, like, that's was, exactly what you it, want. It was and magnificent. Even since last year when a lot of the rules changed, it's so much harder to even see, get an onside kick now point. because you can't even move. So literally percentages were almost cut in half with those rule changes. So great that's point. even more impressive. Yeah, it was. It was nice. So but, had, exactly. That's You had a shot. Even all that being said. You, you had a with, shot. You, with the best, and we've talked about this with Sam, he's the best short yardage quarterback, best red zone quarterback in the country. And yet you were in the red zone and on the goal line with that weapon Twice mm-hmm. and couldn't score a touchdown. You know, considering all that, man, you were man, you were right there. Seven and points. So that shows you how far this program has come, Rod. But I, it just shows you. And Tom Herman talked about this on Monday. the The step you have to take from being a very good team to being an elite team that's the hardest step to take because we've seen it around here in Texas when Texas won a national championship and when they played for one in '09. What were the three things Texas had? You had tremendous talent, mm-hmm. and more so the O nine team was more so you know defensive talent than than really offensive. Talent. I mean, you, but you had Cole McCoy, Jordan Shipley, but I mean, you had freaking Earl Thomas, Lamar Houston, and yeah. Brian Arakpo was just amazing amount mm-hmm. of NFL talent on defense. You had great leadership on both the the O five team and the O eight slash O nine team. Great leadership on both those teams, and you did have a schematic advantage. Your schematic advantage in O five was. You were doing zone reading. You were doing it better than anybody in the country. Mm-hmm. Greg Davis. With Vince Young. Yeah. And your schematic advantage in 08, 09 was Greg Davis reinventing himself, saying, no, we're going to be high percentage passing game. This is Colt McCoy's strength. We'll use Jordan Shipley almost positionless. Oh, you loses a Mike mm-hmm. linebacker. He'll make him a flex tight end yeah. and mm-hmm. just let him go nuts. Yeah. So that and then Will Muschamp's defense, obviously, which Muschamp's defense was also that, that was your time. schematic. Yeah. So that's that's the three things it takes to to be a. Cons- you have to do those three th- three things, in my opinion, consistently throughout a twelve game regular season, a conference championship game, and now two playoff games. You have to have schematic advantage. You have to have elite talent, and you have to have elite leadership. Tom Harmon has said publicly that this game is not the most important game on their schedule. And that, you know what I mean? Like this, you know what I mean? He, he's throwing it out there. And he, that's why I come up with the theory that I and did. Yeah, because yeah, that, and so I could totally see him saying, no, 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 we do got some stuff, you know, some wrinkles, some things we've been working on, some innovative, creative, uh, offensive principles, but 
we're not unveiling them versus LSU because in the Big 12, we're going to need them. We're going to need them versus Oklahoma. We're going to need them in the Big 12 title game, and that's what matters their, to their us. Offensive you game, know what I mean? Their so offensive I game plan that. Their offensive game plan for Oklahoma State will be more dynamic and diverse than the plan for LSU. I know. I was. I expect to see that 10 personnel package, right? One back, zero tight ends they've been talking about. They have this embarrassment of riches at wide receiver. We know that now with DuVernay and Colin Johnson and Brennan Eagles and Malcolm Epps oh, and Jake, Jake Smith. Smith. I know. Yep. They got this, and, and yet we haven't seen it. And I, I was like, I know we're going to see it versus LSU. And we didn't see it. So I assume, okay, maybe. Did we'll you count see the that number of times line. they were in 10 rods? Yeah, because... they did. They did it at the end of the first half and at the end of the second half. I didn't count the exact number of plays. That's so the basically, only time when you're they in two minute in, offense. When they were in two minute offense, you saw the 10 personnel package. But other than that, you didn't see it like actually, you know. During the game, yeah, felt, like they, were, style. felt yeah. like they were felt like they were eleven personnel. Based. They were eleven personnel most, most of the time, which I I said. But the crazy thing about it, they spread them out. They were eleven personnel, but they went to four wide a lot of the times. I was yeah. like, I would say more than half the time they went in eleven personnel. They were they spread them out, and I'm like, man, when you spread them out like that, why not throw Jake Smith or Malcolm Epps in there instead of Cade Brewer? Just to mentally freak them out and yep. force them to go, yeah. all right, oh, oh, oh we got to make an adjustment. And I don't think Texas ever really put them in that. Situation to make them that uncomfortable. That's where the Jake Smith running back situation. He could be that in theory. The, oh, no the make you basically have the that. capability of a three-one-one because he's the type of guy. He could be your Alvin Kamara. Your, we watched Alvin Kamara last night. I yes. mean, he could be or your Tariq Cohen. I, I totally is just believe, a wide well, receiver all those now. guys. I, I totally believe that Jordan Whittington, if he was healthy, would have made a huge impact in this game because Texas was. They did visualize him as kind of their what Alvin Kamara was for the Saints last night, or what Duke Johnson is for the Texans. Everybody's got to have that guy. Jake Smith could be your version of that guy. Rashawn, right now we're just figuring out at running back who the hell can play running back for yep. us. Rashawn Johnson may be a better option right now than Keontae Ingram just because he's doubting himself, and obviously we'll get into his re- reception that should have been. Yeah, before we get there, another big picture thing as we start, and we'll start with the offense. I know initially I said DBU is a good place to start, but we'll, we'll keep, we've talked offense so much. Let's yeah, just yeah, keep we've going gotten there. into it. Rod, I really think Texas, and I know I told you initially three, Texas really lost this game based on four elements of situational football. They lost it in the red zone with the two failed Mm -hmm. fourth and goal tries. They lost it on third down with LSU converting 50%. You're not going to win very many games when the opponent converts 50% of their third downs. Uh, They lost it in two-minute offense and defense at the end of the first half. And they lost it in four-minute defense at, at, at the end of regulation. Man. Even though even though LSU wasn't in traditional four minute offense, they're still on the attack. But you know, we said the onside kick, and let's go ahead and talk. Well, actually, let's talk about defense because since we're there, you want to start there? Let's go. You let's do it. You had them exactly where you wanted them. I mean, you that did. situation in a six point game, you got a third and seventeen. Third and 17. You're thinking, get off the field, force a punt. You got the ball in Sam Ellinger's hands oh, with two something left on the clock. I mean, it really that's is. exactly where you want to be. <laughs> Yeah. I, yeah, even though you didn't deserve it based on your defensive performance, you still ended up, you know, because you your guys played with pressure. grit, they played with heart, at least they played hard. You got third and 17. I mean, that's uh, I'm with you. That, that you was the best case scenario. You got drive right before. When you get and, that sack, you feel as if when you force it into that, the third and 17, you feel so good. And Ed Erzron said, he said, um, yeah, yeah, thank God, thank <laughs> God that they made the third and 17, they converted it. To a touchdown, he said, "I knew if they got the ball back, we couldn't stop them. Just to be honest, we couldn't stop them." Yeah, so, the video yeah. of that's great. So yeah, you can see it in his face. He, he knew. was like, "Oh, no. he knew." Are yeah, you going, became, you going became, Samurai at Orgeron again, man? Yeah, it yeah, became, oh. it, <laughs> yeah, I love it. Oh. It was like Cookie Monster. I could literally movie. watch. Every, I listened to his whole press conference last week just for the hell of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it became a Big Twelve shootout in the end, and you know, Texas can be Texas is comfortable there. Yeah. So, Rod, let's talk about the third and seventeen uh, oh. specifically. Yeah. Tom Herman said on Monday, if he had to do it all over again, they liked the call. They felt it was the right call. He doesn't live and could have, would have, should have. But that's just because he doesn't want to throw Tar Orlando under the bus. So give him props because that's his boy. This, yeah. this to me, third and seventeen. That's exactly the situation you devised the cowboy package for. Uh, I agree, but they did. Obviously, he wasn't confident in the cowboy package because we only. Well, I will say this: I got to go back and find out how many 
third and longs you had them in well, um, or a second and long or whatever, but they only had it four times that I counted. And how many timeouts and did Texas have then? Because I now, didn't know if they had time to sub it in. I will, that's a great point, too. Great point, Matt. Um, I will say that the four plays, the, the, the interception by Joseph Asai was the Cowboy yeah. package. I was so uh, happy. Was a, I was like, bring it all right? day. And that was a third and 18. Uh, but then against the Cowboy package, they picked up nine yards, 18 yards, and 21 yards. And I think at one, I think the 21 yard was a touchdown. Uh, matter of fact, it might be the one right before the half, if I'm not uh, mistaken. I didn't won the Jefferson. The um, so, yeah, I think at that point he started losing faith in it. But, hell, he probably lost faith in everything because there was nothing working against Joe Burrow once he got in his own. Well, and that's a point where sometimes, and we talked about it in, throughout the offseason, that it sucks to admit it, but sometimes in Texas the called football, a timeout right before the third and 17. Well, then they could have done it easily. Yeah, they did, <laughs> to talk about it, which is why I think it's interesting that they, they – they all agreed on let's go all out blitz with a spy. Yeah, they, 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 they with zero coverage. That's what that means. Tom Herman discussed it. They all discussed it. Which is my take is my take on it is because nothing had worked. Right. That that they could go back to and say, hey man, we remember this worked really well. Let's do this now. I'm with Matt. I go back to the cowboy package. Yeah. I'm like, man, you know what? Hey, at least in the Cowboy package, we got a tip pass and a pick. Let's run the Cowboy package. And what I would have done, just she would just know my ask me, hey, what what would you have done? I would have done kind of the, a ghost front. I would have put six guys at the line of scrimmage, all of them standing up, moving around, shuffling around. Hell, I probably would have only rushed four. You know what I mean? And I'd have probably dropped seven. And I'd have had two, I'd have had kind of two safeties kind of over the top, everybody else in zero coverage and a spy. Yeah. That's probably the way I would have, uh, you know, I would have done. I, I would have my guys in man under, two safeties over the top, so they can play man under and they can jump some of the underneath routes. Safeties over the top, so that you know what happened didn't happen. All right, yeah. play two man under with with a spy, and I think you had to do that because they had four guys on routes. You had four plus two, six. Seven, yeah, you had seven guys dropping back. For rushing, or you can rush three, yeah. but as long as he can identify who's coming, at least you can manufacture pressure. The problem was Texas couldn't really manufacture a lot of pressure because Joe Burrow was getting the ball out quickly. Yeah, he yeah. got it off so fast. And I heard your numbers that you brought up from Brooks Cabina oh, yesterday, great, which yeah. just he had about a great breakdown. when you look overall, if you get the ball out in about two to two and a half seconds, almost yeah, no I'll pass give you the rush numbers. will it ever was unbelievable. get there. So, like when you look at the modern offenses, and if you are executing at the highest level, optimal offense is almost indefensible which is why i think in some of these situations you see well we just got to bring all the blitz and get to them before because even if you're well defended they can still out execute you when you get optimal offense i agree desperation and panic move yeah. by Tyler Lando, but like i said i don't know what else he was going to do that would have worked but I, I know that was the wrong call like that that's not the call hmm. that i would have made I, I think that was the wrong call if burrow got uh, how about this burrow got the ball out in 2.4 seconds on average in that game. That's insanely good. 2.4 seconds on average, which means your pre-snap read is in, like, perfect. Like You trust it yeah. almost implicitly. Like, right? You don't doubt your pre-snap read at all if you're getting the ball out that quickly, which means Todd Orlando was not the master of the art of confusion. Because the defense, he's, supposed he's to identified confuse Burrow's them. been pre-snap. able to identify. That means he's identifying it even before then and going, oh, you know that uh, that touchdown pass to Justin Jefferson right before the half? He got it out in 2.28 seconds, according, according to Brooks Cabina. But he that's, was in his that's kind of my, that's kind of my point, though. Like, Rod, there you know? was no... We didn't see like the ghost fronts or anything that we've seen Todd no. Orlando do. It was yeah. just kind of like, hey, we're either they were in cover one most of the game. It seemed like to yeah. me, they played some they zone realized... early on, but then they they went to cover. It, it's the almost that's what, that's really, at least that's what Joe Burrow. It's almost like pressure. it's almost like they really approached it from. And I know I'm repeating myself, but it's like, hey, we're just going to match up, and we, we think nothing. ours are better than yours. Nothing, but and also yeah. I think they went nothing work because look here, I give you some some other numbers. Right, he got the ball out really quickly, but he was 22 of 28 for 253 yards, two touchdowns one interception when he was passing the ball under 2.6 seconds when he got the ball out from snap to release in 2.6 seconds or less but he was 11 of 13 when he got the ball out in more than 2.6 seconds that both <laughs> for 236 yards you have a two touchdowns i mean he, when, when he got the ball out in less than two seconds he was 10 of 13 for 77 yards it got to the point where if he holds the ball he was killing you if he got it out quickly he was killing you there was a, he had an insulation within the pass protection with the quick passing game and Tarlan 
Orlando, honestly, he was he was flummoxed. He was he had no he was the one that was confused. He had no answer for Joe Burrow, and Joe Burrow had all the answers to the test. And that's where you tip your hat to a guy like that. If you can execute offense at that highest level, sometimes I really think it can be almost indefensible, which is why, like you said, it's a last resort situation. Well, what can you do? Get pressure to him, and if you have one chance to get get him or hit him, see if he doesn't make the play. And even on the final play, the pressure got there. It's just he made an unbelievably great pass by sidestepping through three defenders and Dick. hitting them in the money in stride right along the line to where in those situations, I think that it just came down to, well, worst case scenario, no matter what we go and whatever I decide, they've been executing and making these plays. So therefore, they're going to be able to complete it unless somehow we get to the quarterback. That's the only way there, we can possibly There was a point right in the second half where I felt watching it from the press box. It felt like Todd Orlando's just kind of throwing stuff at the wall and hoping something sticks at the Totally point. agree. Yeah. And, and that's no knock on him. And, and Brandon Jones said in the post game, like, yeah, LSU did stuff that they weren't necessarily ready for. So they felt like the coaches did the best job they could of of getting them ready for this game. But Rod, this this goes back to the Big Twelve. This go no, this goes back to Rod, something you said in the summer when we were talking LSU. The biggest advantage LSU was gonna have in this game is that there was no way you could prepare for every single nook and cranny of this Joe Brady offense. There was That's no exactly way you could right. do it. So yeah, new. No doubt. And, Bad and, timing for Texas. And, and what do you do if you're Todd Orlando when how do you build a defense when you can't really cover and you can't really organically create a pass rush. Yes. Like, what That's do you do? That's two huge problems right? on defense. Like, how do you, right? Because uh, well, when, 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 when they targeted when they when they targeted the team. three corners, when Joe Burrow targeted three corners, he, he targeted them 15 times. He was 13 of 15 for 216 yards, mm-hmm. uh, one touchdown and one two-point conversion. So your corners can't cover. The, those are your coverage specialists. They can't really cover. Uh, I think part of the reason you moved Brandon Jones to nickel was because you really worried about B.J. Foster in coverage, too. Mm-hmm. So you worried about guys in coverage. Caden Stearns is not the wolf right now. He's just Caden because he looks like he's That a, ankle he's a, looks like it's bothering him. You know him. what I mean? Something's yeah. going on there. So when you can't really cover and you can't your, – your, your front guys, they're good, but they're not natural pass rushers and disruptors. What do you do? Right now, all your sacks and pressures are coming from the back end. B.J. Foster's out. He's your best blitzer. Yeah. Joseph Asai is your only other guy that can create disruption. So you take him away. He's got two interceptions. You take him away from coverage and start start rushing him more. What do you do? Yeah, and now the Cowboy package really can't be utilized as much because you're BJ down Foster, man. Well, yeah, exactly. It's not as effective. Yeah. Because now you're you're going to be without your best blitzer for at least a couple weeks. It's a big well, part of the Cowboy there. package. And the big point of having it was to get your best 11 on the field, and then that's one of them being taken away. So, so now you Rob, may still have that seven. Any most inexperienced defense in the last 30 years on Texas football. We, we, we knew there was going to be growing pains with this defense. I, I want to talk about corner, though, because I, I'll give Jalen Green a little bit of benefit of the doubt because a lot of the plays I saw him give up, there were some plays he gave up, Rod, where he's in position to make a play. Just yeah. Jamar Chase or whoever he was covering made a better play. Those mm. receivers said it on the sideline, too, in the first quarter. You heard Maria Taylor's report saying that they were like, no, we can get us the ball. We and can I, beat these guys. And, and we did. knew, look, we knew that, look, we said this when we talked about corner. And, and since this game turned into a Big 12 game, there are going to be some weeks, man, where these young corners, it just ain't going to be there. It's just not. Some days in this league, Rod, you know this, you mm-hmm. you were even in the Big 12 before yeah. everyone was throwing the ball around. There's some weeks where it's it's just it's just not your day. No, I agree. It's a bad day at the office. But I say that, and I'll say this too, that other corner, whatever they're going to do there, this week leading up to the Rice game is when you've got to figure out. If you're going with Kobe Boyce, then figure out how to help him. If you're not, then go with Anthony Cook or Deshaun Jameson and get them ready for the Oklahoma State game. I think what we figured out is I don't think you can trust any of the corners. So you need to bring them along slowly. I'm not saying they're going to develop. They're going to get better. They're going to be better. If you need reps, they'll get better. Aren't right? They're very they young. They aren't good. They yeah, just, exactly. Yeah. Um, but they need help now. You cannot leave them out on an island. You cannot. That's what Todd Orlando's one of his sins in that game. Mm-hmm. He just left them on an island. It was like, eh, they'll figure it out. Nope, they never figured it out. Mm-hmm. All right, they gave up five passes of 20 yards or more. All right, they were getting they were getting torched out there. You got to give them help. Put them in zone coverage. All right, back them off a little bit. Let them give up the underneath routes so they're not giving up the twenty plus yard pass receptions. All right, um, you want an explosive play stat, right? I know you like explosive I play love it. nuggets. Joe uh, Joe Burrow completed thirteen passes of fifteen yards or more in that explosive play category. 
that accounted for 343 of his passing yards. Yeah. Those 13 completions. Yeah, man. You got to, you got to. You, You're not dying death by paper cuts. You're dying death by uppercuts. <laughs> yeah. I agree. No, I'm with you. So, I, so I'm saying you this is Mike Tyson bludgeoning you and the referee's not stopping the fights. Yeah. You need to help them out, man. Put them in zone. Give them more split coverage. Give them more help underneath. Don't just assume they can hold up on out. Now, against Louisiana Tech, yes, Jalen Green can hold up on an out. In other quarterbacks. All right? Against like Kansas. And again, yeah, when you go up against Oklahoma, no. They mm-hmm. cannot hold up. Yeah. Against Oklahoma State, no. Don't assume they can hold up. Against an elite quarterback, an elite wide receiver, do not assume they can hold up. Don't do that. Give them help. And I, I think you'll see that because, I, again, I, I do put stock in the – some of what Tom Herman says, and I know some of it's coach speak, and that's not me knocking Tom Herman. Every coach across the country, they're not 100% truthful in their yeah. their press conferences. But I think he even said it when he talked about the defense getting better. He said, if, if that means we need to dial back a little bit, so be it. I mean, we saw that Todd Orlando's yeah. first game against Maryland when some of these same issues were happening. And then it was bad run fits, but you saw, hey, just maybe simplify things a little bit. And yeah. with a young defense, maybe you got to do that. Maybe you do have to pull back a little bit. Look, we, we've we seen the flashes from Keandre Covert and Jalen Green, Rod and Joseph Osai. Like we, we know there's talent there. No question. Oh, yeah. It's just talent collectively wasn't ready to go out on that stage and stop an offense when you've got the the combination of athletes and schematic advantage like LSU has. That's exactly right. And, and you'll only have that, in, honestly, in the Big 12 probably – Two Oklahoma. More times. Oklahoma's probably Oklahoma the only State's time. offense looks really good. So it does. I'm going to say they got some talent that right. Well, you know well, I mean? And I've gone on record saying I think Mike Gundy's the best coach in the league. Exactly. We know he has you hellaciously I mean? good so games. Say, I'll say twice and then the Big 12 title game every three times. And I'll so, just say, go. in to total respect to Big 12 offenses, because you know we talk constantly about it here, no but question. Joe Burrow, that quarterback play, what he did was as good as you're going to see at the no. college level any year ever. Like that's it how. Is. And he's if you go to a zone, he can find the mesh points and pick it apart. Like, it comes down to the man-to-man, and there are things you can change, but when you're on the fly and having to decide, it's so hard to do. That's where it seems it's tough to say, but, but it's a great primer for the Big 12. It's a good like, – you aren't yeah. going to see much before, more. Rod, before your so point – at least you get to learn Before today. your point, to back up what Matt's saying, there were some throws Joe Burrow made. The one that sticks out to me is – the touchdown pass he threw to Terrace Marshall where Josh Thompson had his back to the ball. Mm-hmm. Like Josh Thompson's right on him. And yes. there, there's no way Joe Burrow saw where Terrace Marshall's catch radius was. It's just that's that's like the perfect throw in that Red scenario. Throw, he put it he put execution. it in the he put it in the only place he could put it for that play to be a touchdown. It was a good throw. But Same I'll say this. I, I remember him saying after the Joe Burrow after the Georgia Southern game, when you when you call a play and have answers to every coverage and every mm-hmm. blitz, that's a good feeling. So my thing is this. He he went on to say, he said that if they drop eight and take away the verticals, I have the check down underneath. This is my thing about Texas. Make him take the check downs. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. so drop, big, like, you know what I mean? Go He's front it, go scum- front it, and, and rush three and drop eight. When you're getting smashed, when, when he sees a smashing you, get to the point you're like, all right, you know what? I'm rushing three and dropping eight. And sometimes it's going to be Joseph Fasai and BJ Foster. And just make sometimes do it 12 just times. Make, yeah, just make, make, exactly. Make him dump it down every damn time. And if that's what he wants to do. But the fact was, you didn't you didn't do that. Like, you got to the you made it easy for him. You were giving him cover one, and you were coming at him. And and he was getting the ball out quickly because he was diagnosing it before the play. You did not confuse him. You did no. not discombobulate him. Exactly. He was comfortable. I know, I, know, I know Coach Harmon said the defensive line was disruptive. Man, I didn't see that. He, did he look disruptive to you? He looked very comfortable in that pocket. Disruption means he's moving around. He's freaking out. There were a couple of plays like that, but for the most part, no. That was not done yeah. by the D-line. I, I think the, the, you know D, I mean? the D-line, the good stuff I saw, the, I, thought they the were, I thought they were good versus the run. Yeah. And there were times where I mean, Malcolm Roach got to Joe Burrow a few times. Uh, I didn't like the roughing the Joe passer Burrow call. He didn't have a quarterback place. hurry. Not How can fi- we say not, he got not, to- not officially, but there, there were. There he didn't have a. Let me say, stats don't matter. Dude, give me a quarterback hurry. There were there, there hur- were times hurry, there were times the though. Going, there were times though where I thought Malcolm not not enough to make a difference. You get in my the end. point. You get my point. Though? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, sorry, coach. I'm sorry. I'm I'm I'm, I'm gonna say you're wrong on that. Then you need to have pressure stats because pressure means he got there. But you ain't get your your D line ain't got a quarterback hurry. I think Malcolm Rogers got one. You know what I mean? In the game versus Louisiana Tech. Come on, man. Yeah, Havoc plays. <laughs> I need y'all oh, to do a yeah. little bit more up there. Nine Havoc plays is okay. No, I was. Uh, that's kind of that's kind of me being devil's advocate a little bit because I, I did see some good stuff from the D line, but not enough. Not enough to say that Keandre, that any of those guys were 
were outstanding or played a very good game. Well, and we already know on this defense, and Tom Herman admits it, the defensive line isn't necessarily there. I mean, you'd like them to get pressure, but the way it's designed with, you know, Orlando's way he brings pressure, it isn't necessarily – they eat up bodies and they eat up – I know, up but linemen. you need somebody on that you. front thing. Happen, so you need to add Joseph Asai basically Agreed. to the pass rush now and quit dropping them back in coverage. You need to do something because right now I'm sorry, but your D-line is not as much of a difference maker in the passing game. Agreed. Run game, yes. That was the fail state. Like when you talk Agreed. about what parts are missing of the of a defense and what left, the one thing you yes. miss on the D line, you miss the fact that when all when when all hell broke loose and you needed to go make a play, you could turn Charles Amenahu loose and he'd go make. You a can play. just put him wide and go. All right, dog, just go. Just yep. go get back there. Just go get back in. Just the go line up in a wide nine and go. Just go. And get think about it. You've had go that. If you're Toronto, you've you had that because uh-huh. Puna, Puna. Was the, Puna's the guy he's talking about. Stats don't matter. Yeah, with Puna, it don't matter. Yeah, it's Puna freaking forward who's gonna start for the Seattle freaking Seahawks. I remember their legion of bleeding the boom 2.0. Yes, with him it doesn't matter because he's 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 such a chaotic force of nature yeah. that it takes two guys to stop him, and in every play he's pushing the pocket. You don't have that. Nope. I've watched him. It's not right that. now. You don't. So and you had, and you know what he's talking about too. Ed Oliver. Okay, yes. With Ed Oliver, <laughs> stats don't matter because he's a freak of nature. You don't have that. So you need to build the defense accordingly. You know what I mean? Like, quit, like, quit going on faith and prayer. Like, and I love prayer. It, you know, you got to, you need it. But this, football not is not, it's not a way to build a football strategy. You're going with hope and faith. That's what that play was about. Third and seventeen. I hope they get there. Have they gotten there all all day? I hope they hold up in coverage. Have they held up in coverage all day? No, to both. So then why you would you do that in yeah. the most important play? And, and as we shift to the offense, that was that was kind of my thing on the second goal to go situation. Um, the first one, if Keonta Ingram catches the ball, we're having a totally different conversation about it. Agreed. That was a great play call, by the way. It was. Oh yeah, great play. But the, the second one, Rod, to me, there was nothing in the first three plays that should have inspired confidence. Yeah, we'll stick it in there on fourth and goal. I agree with that. I'm yeah. with you on that. And that's and that's bad too because you're supposed to have Bam Bam Sam and that's supposed to be like your bread and butter. Which is LSU why on third down stadium. not st- it's more of an idea ideology yeah. that if you get the ball back right there and you're gonna pass on first down, well you're passing all four. If you're and running on first down, you're running all four and you're running Sam and the idea that yeah Maybe you wanted cute. to change it up. You can't, you can't do that. You got yeah. If you trust Sam and you know how good he is, you go with Sam all four in a totally row. Agree. This is that game. And totally L- agree. And when LSU, that happened on third, you're like, oh, LSU no. knew the power stretch was coming. Ed Orgeron even said it. He said they tipped it off. Well, that's one thing. We, Which I think they may have been doing coming, on purpose. Though. That's true, too. Which I think they were doing on purpose. Because remember, they had like two counters to it. They had the Keontae Ingram counter, and they had the delayed release by Cade Brewer, which was also a counter. Both of those failed. Kind of the yeah. jump pass deal, yeah. 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 But that that's what Texas runs on the goal line, and and, and LSU's L, LSU played that rod. That's how you want to play that. Like, hey, just submarine the offensive lineman, let your linebackers and safeties go fill and make a play. Why do they always run it to the right? Is that because Sam is right handed? Like, is I, that yeah, what it is? I, I is it think because it's, Sam is right handed. I think it's because it's an easier throw. Okay, for do the they quarterback. Pull, why don't they pull Cosme and Braun and turn it into like a power? Probably up? because at that point is it too, you're, you're is it probably too, worried too, about too penetration. Long developing? Yeah, you know what I mean. Okay. About penetration. I'm just I'm just trying to figure out like because and cause I don't you, know you the answer because your two best blocking offensive linemen are on the left and yet you run most of that. I don't know the answer. It's a stretch more than a sweep in that team it where it's slow it developing it's slow where developing. you don't have it as much. Yeah. I don't know the answer, either. but just like, you know, uh, Brad Kellner and I were talking, like, why don't you go quarterback sneak there? And I know they've got quarterback sneak in the playbook. Of course but, they do. But I think for for Tom Herman, and just thinking about it, number one, you go from the shotgun because you that's your, the basis of your offense. It's, uh, you're operating from the shotgun. Yeah. It's an easier downhill read for the ball carrier, number that's one. That's true, and your momentum. Right, and oh, number that's, two. Oh, number that's one. 230 pounds coming Sam down I think I think when yeah. things get mucked up on a quarterback sneak, you never go under center. And I think for Tom Herman, I don't know this, but pro- trying to just kind of get inside of his, I think the risk of – Something bad happening, center quarterback is changing the risk of a we turnover. never do that. Right. The There's risk no of a comfort, turnover yeah. probably isn't worth the reward. And that's, that's a, a good point. I agree with you, especially when they know it's coming. Yeah. They're they going to get a good BGO. Like if you're under, yeah. if Texas is under center, you there's only one coming. thing they're going to do. Yeah. They, I, I don't think I've ever seen them and under center doing it. Well, like, I'll go back to the risk. Texas Tech game last year. Like Charles Amendo, who said all the film he studied on Texas Tech, he said when they're point. under center, they do one thing they go quarterback sneak. They don't do anything else. And then he jumped the gap. Yeah. And it's a multiplier of risk. Not only are you 
bringing all of that into play then though your one strength is your guy with momentum inertia going forward and he and has now he may not have that still. he just have to like you plow don't have ahead. it and i mean you have to have weight yeah. behind just to have any type of inertia no i feel that um no, got a lot of love for charles on the podcast this week charles Menno? yeah yeah, yeah, Charles Menu should be getting love. Texans love him, apparently, and I think he's going to end up playing more and more. I, I didn't get a chance to watch him that much in the game. I didn't pay attention. Yeah, he was inactive last night. Oh, he was inactive? Okay. At the last second, go. but he's right. still a long No, they like him, plane. though. They like him they a like lot. Him. Yeah. All right, uh, let's go ahead and get to Mike Roach, get some recruiting Q&A stuff out of the way, and when we come back, we'll uh, we'll finish up the offensive we'll talk, talk Rice, and make some picks. All right, it is that time of the Blitz where we talk recruiting, and with that, we are not going to – Crowley, Texas, and Tarrant County, America. We're going live to Las Vegas, where Horns 24-7 recruiting editor Mike Roach joins us. Mike, thanks for taking a break from your break to talk a little recruiting coming off of a huge recruiting weekend. Before we get to the Q&A part, and that's how Mike and I are going to do this. Uh, Those of you who haven't seen Mike and Bobby Burton have a recruiting podcast, State of Recruiting. Go get that where you get all your fine podcasts. So, Mike's portion of the Blitz, we're basically going to turn this into a Q&A just to give you guys a different format so we're not completely overlapping. But, Mike, before we get into the Q&A, uh, it sounds like all the feedback from uh, one of the biggest visit weekends that I can remember since I've been following this program. Sounds like everything went well. Jatavian Sanders commits. Uh, a lot of good momentum for Texas coming out of this weekend. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even you know, I think we said going into the weekend, it's it's optimal if you get a win, but you know, as we saw, you can you can sell a close loss, and I think that uh, they were able to do that. Obviously, Landon Jatavian Sanders is big. Um, he's a kid I've loved forever. I mean, he is uh, – I saw him last year in a game. He had zero offers and, and racked up about six sacks in that game, and uh, one of the best two-way players in the state, fantastic pass rusher, can also be, you know, a, t- a flex tight end type of guy, about 6'3", 220, and, and still growing. So, um you know, I think he's he's ultimately going to end up on the defensive side of the ball, and that's just more options for, for Todd Orlando. Good deal. Well, like I said, we're going to turn this into a QA. and a and uh, since it was short notice, all of our questions this week are coming from the flagship message board at Horns 24-7, so thank you to everybody who submitted questions. Mike, first question from UT Hook'em 3. Next five 2021 commitments. Ooh, that's a good question. Um you know, I think that we're we're at a position to where I, well, I keep saying this, but it, it keeps not happening. But I think we're at a position where uh, that uh, that class is going to slow down a little bit as they want to, you know, obviously go into that cycle with some room to operate. Yeah. Um, but there are a couple guys I'm looking at. Uh, I would say JoJo Earl is, is probably a guy I think makes a call before the the, the calendar year ends, and I think it would be Texas. Um, so he'd be one of them. Um, I think that uh, if you're looking at, at safety, J.D. Coffey is another guy that I think Texas would take and, and I think is close to making a decision. Um, you know, I think a running back happens at some point uh, very soon. I think it's uh, it's either L- L.J. Johnson or Kamar Wheaton. Um both those guys are very high on Texas. Both were at the game and, and had a great time. Um, so I would say them. I could circle back to um, circle back to receiver and say Latrell Neville as well. I think that that he's always really been high on Texas and um, in, in again is circling a decision date. I'm going to go out on a limb a little bit based on, on something I reported in the Stampede uh, for number five. I'm going to say Donovan Jack, the offensive lineman from Bel Air Episcopal. Wow. Um, it's not a uh, one that I'm as confident on as the others, but I think Texas made up its, made a ton of progress, maybe it, more with him than any other prospect uh, in attendance that weekend. That's interesting, Mike, and I think we've got an O-line question coming up. But, yeah, that's – that's a name when we talk offensive line in that class. We talk about the Brocker Myers. We talk about Savian Bird, even Bryce Foster. But uh, Donovan Jackson, I don't know if it's just seemed like, well, maybe that's not attainable. But like you said, uh, big recruiting weekend. Texas making up a lot of ground with Donovan Jackson. Who, Mike, was he the O-line MVP at the opening? Did I got that right? 
Yeah, O line MVP as a junior competing <laughs> or as as a sophomore going into his junior year competing against you know juniors going into their senior years. Very very good prospect. Uh, Mike, next question from uh, Pack on R forty six. Mike, is it possible to over recruit cornerback and running back in this twenty twenty class? Considering what we saw on Saturday, is it possible the coaches are looking under every rock for immediate help? Could you even add linebacker depth outside of Osai and McCulloch? The talent just drops. Yeah, I think it is possible to over recruit. It is possible to watch one game um, or even one season and see results and take bad takes because you think if you just throw enough numbers at the problem that that, that will fix it. Yeah, That's not how the staff operates. They – you know, the the most impressive thing to me about the way that Tom Herman and his staff put together classes is they've established a new baseline. And the bottom of the roster is much better than I think the bottom of the roster has been in the last 20 years. And, Great and you, point. Don't, you, you don't get that way by just taking guys because, oh, we had a bad game at corner. You know, you, you stick to your plan. You develop your guys you have on campus. You take guys that you think can be legitimate players at the next level in this class, and you continue to recruit. And I think that that's what they're going to do. You don't take corners just to take them or linebackers or, or running backs or whatever. Um, you know, it, it seems like they have a plan with everyone. And, you know, in this class, obviously, 2020, if you look at running back, they've got a five-star in Bijan Robinson. They've got a perfect fit that they like for a guy in Ty Jordan if they can land him. I don't see them going outside of that just because they've had, you know, running back issues this year. Yeah, and on top of that, something that, you know, we're obviously talking about on the Blitz, talking about on the message board uh, and on the site, I mean, Roshan Johnson to running back could end up being permanent the way that thing's looking right now. So, uh, yeah, I, I think at this point they've got a guy in the house that maybe they like, so – Probably don't reach for a uh, for another running back in the 2020 class. Mike, next question. Uh, we're starting to stack real good O-line and have a good one already. How does this affect the top 21 or 22 O-line recruits, knowing we're getting more and more talent at their position before they even get here? I mean, it's obviously it's something that schools will use against Texas, and but, you know, the, the way you do that is you combat that by it. Um, you know, I'm just talking about at your system and, and how you're starting to produce. And I think that it's not going to, it doesn't look like it's going to slow them down in 21. Um, may, it may come calling in 22, but that may be at a time where you don't need as many guys. And, you know, 21 and 22 are producing enough offensive linemen that, you know, you'll be able to just still take some quality, quality players. And maybe they're not, you know, the, the top, very top guys on your board, but, uh, those classes are stacked with talent. So the need isn't as much there because there isn't a scarcity of talent. So, um, I, you know, I think that with anything, you, you've just got to keep recruiting and you've got to figure out. And I think winning national championships obviously helps a lot, but you got to figure out how Bama does it. You know, I mean, nobody ever questions Bama on, hey, you took a lot of really good offensive or defensive linemen last year, you know, so. Yeah, and if you look at the – just the recruiting rankings, it's not like Clemson's bringing in, you know, elite offensive line talent. Defensive line is another – that's another issue altogether. But, uh, yeah, it's not like Clemson is just stacking elite talent on the offensive line. They're just finding a way to, to make it work. Uh, and not that they're recruiting bad prospects either, but I think everybody gets the point. Mike, we've had a lot of questions about this guy, and this kind of bleeds into really the next two questions. Uh, Loic Fungi, is he a priority, the wide receiver out of Midland Lee? Uh and then the next question is, Mike, last four to five to finish the 2020 class. If you're getting a receiver question and somebody's asking about also about the last four to five to finish the 2020 class, that all kind of ties together. Yeah, you know, I think Texas likes a lot of but um, I don't know that he's necessarily a priority at this point. And I'll add that, you know, when Texas offered him in the summer, it's not like he – it didn't seem to blow him away. and He never really showed that much return interest in it. Um his parents are like or or more mechanical or, or petroleum engineers, I believe, out in Midland. Um, they are immigrants from Africa. They don't know anything about college football, so they're not like Texas doesn't blow their skirt up in a way that it does other people. And right. um, you know, and so it was never like, oh wow, Texas off me for him. You know, I think it was a lot of schools that that recruited him more, you know, early. So. 
I, I don't know he's necessarily a priority. I think if he were around and wanted in near the end, Texas would absolutely take him, but it would depend on what happens with a lot of their other receiver takes. Um, I really only can see maybe one more receiver in this class, honestly. And I, I think it's, you know, if we're going to blend in right to that next question. I don't know if there's five more guys in this class. I think there may be four. I think re- realistically you're looking at Ty Jordan at running back. You're looking at either L.V. Bunkley, Shelton, uh, at receiver, probably just him. You know, I think he's he's pretty much the top guy. You know, I think there was some dancing back and forth with Jackson Smith, Jigba, um, but I think that ship is, is starting to sail. Um, and then uh, on the defensive side of the ball, I think that I think they're going to find a linebacker. Um, I don't know who it's going to be. Maybe it's Josh White. Maybe they can do something with Lenith Whitehead. Maybe they find another guy altogether. But I think they're going to find a body there, maybe. And then defensive line, um, Alfred Collins. I mean, I think that's the four last guys that we see now. Mm-hmm. Down the stretch, you know, they've always seemed to find a Juco guy at a position of need or something like that they can pop up. But those are the only guys that are on the board right now I can see finishing out. Yeah, Mike, to to that point, I was going to follow up with something. I mean, could linebacker end up being a Juco guy like instead of like you talked about I, I like the way you painted the picture, uh not you know reaching for guys just to take a body. Maybe Todd Orlando goes through the evaluations and sees, "Hey, here's a kind of like what they found with Jawan Mitchell. I know you're not going to find that every year, but maybe you find a, a 3 to play 4, a 4 to play 3, excuse me, type guy and just decide, "Hey, this is this is better than anybody at the high school level we'd take in this class. Yeah, I think I mean they just always seem to keep a couple spots and, and kind of scan the JUCO. I mean, what they did last year in the JUCO in grad transfer market when we thought they were long done with that class and said, no, we got Park LeBron. Nope, we're taking Willie Tyler. Nope, we're taking Juwan Mitchell. So um, obviously, you know, they're always looking for guys, and I think you're you're right that. That defensive line. I also another hunch I have, and I've said this for a while, and I don't know. You know, it's just it's purely gut. I don't think they're necessarily done at the tight end position, um, and I think that the JUCO market could weigh in there as well. Gotcha. Yeah, that's a definitely a good call, Mike. Last question we've got: uh, Longhorn fan eight one five on the board is going to finish this up this week. Are we still pursuing Jace? I assume he means McClellan. Uh, which D lineman in 2021 would you say we're heading for, at, we're leading for, excuse me, uh, at current moment? So I guess J- Jace McClellan and then 2021 promising D line prospect. Uh, you know, Texas isn't, I don't think, actively just, just beating down Jace's door. Um, I think they would still very much be interested. Mm-hmm. If he were if he were interested, you know, if he wanted, if he indicated interest on his end, um, I'm not sure that they would turn him away. You know, Texas has talked to Bijan Robinson about uh, taking two running backs. He knows that that's the case. And, and basically, from what I understand, the message was, hey, when we thought you were going to Ohio State, we started recruiting all these other guys, and we've got to take two. So these are the guys we're recruiting. Um, and, and from what I understand, he's okay with that. So, uh, you know, I think that they would absolutely still take him, but I don't think it's a, a case where they're, like, calling him every single day like they would uh, typically be working on a guy. As far as 2021 D linemen, um, that's a good question because I feel like they're they're deep in the mix for a lot of guys. Um, I think they're right up there for Landon Jackson. I think they're in that top group for Tumishi Adelier. Um, I think they, they lead for a guy like uh, uh, Shamar Turner from DeSoto, um, so I guess if I had to say a guy, I think that they outright lead for, um, yeah, I'll say Shamar Turner from DeSoto. I think, uh, I think that they've, they've kind of come a long way when it comes to him. And, uh, I think the other two are, they're, they're right up there, but, um, I think that, that there's some other schools in the mix for them. Folks, you can find him on Twitter at Mike Roach 247, get all of his fine work at Horns 24 seven. Dot com and the State of Recruiting podcast with Mike and Bobby Burton is now at a podcast server near you. Mike, anything else you need to plug before we let you go? No, man, just uh, keep listening to the Blitz. Come on over and listen to the State of Recruiting 
Um, you can find both those podcasts on places where you get your podcasts. And uh, no, that's about it. I appreciate you uh, for accommodating me on the phone this week. <laughs> so what's on the agenda? What's on the Vegas agenda the rest of the day and the rest of the time you're there? Uh, my beautiful wife and I are about to go to breakfast, and then uh, we we're just walking around the strip. She had a, a fortunate day at the roulette table yesterday, so nice. we're going to try to capitalize on that a little more. The hockey guy that I am, I placed a futures bet on the Stars to win the Stanley Cup. There you go. Uh, so I'll be holding that ticket all year. But, yeah, it's going to be a, just a relaxing day. I mean, we're really just trying to, you know, relax on this trip. All right, Mike. Well, you guys take care, and we'll do it again next week. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Later. All right, big thanks to Mike for that recruiting segment. Uh, gentlemen, Let's. Uh, I want to finish up the conversation with the offense, and, and I just want to reiter- reiterate by saying, going back to what we talked about at the top, we're nitpicking this game, but yeah, in a lot of ways, Texas played well enough to win and showed they could match LSU athlete for athlete. And in the LSU guys, Chris Hummer's got a fantastic story on 24-7 Sports right now where he quoted a lot of the LSU guys, Jacoby Stevens was one, saying, no, that, that's, that's an elite ball club. Yeah, over there. Chase on actually said he apologized uh, to Sam yeah, Ellinger. <laughs> said he took back his words. That's, his, that's heavy acknowledgement. Yeah. Yeah. When it's and very like complimentary. That. And yeah. my thing on Sam Rod he didn't and, even and, have like I said an A plus game. And I'll say this as we start to wrap it up. Sam like you said, right. he he didn't have an, an, an a, a game, and I think he would he would say that. But Sam Ellinger is racking up this list of just impressive outings that nobody's going to remember because the other guy was just that much better. Wow. Well, and oddly, like we you remember. Go, well, hold him. on. You, you, oh, I know where you're going. You go, go back. Go back to his freshman year, the USC game. He was great in that game, right? Sam Darnold has the the drive in the last minute, and they go down, and kick the field goal, and they mm-hmm. win it in overtime. Yep. The OU game. Sam's great, right? Did 300 passing, 100 rushing. Baker Mayfield throws a winning touchdown. OU ends up winning the Big 12. You go back to last year. Sam had set a career high in passing yards against West Virginia. Will Greer throws a winning touchdown, oh, runs in a winning two-point conversion. That was brutal. Conversion. And a two-point conversion. And the Big 12 championship game, as good as Sam's numbers were, Kyler Murray's a little bit better, and he ends up winning the Heisman the next week. So all the all these great games Sam Ellinger's co- compiling, it's almost like, Rod, as you say, it's like the Shakespearean tragedy. Like Texas, yeah. as a Texas fan, like Ronnie Millsap can see, like you've got your answer quarterback now. Like there's no question. If you don't believe in Sam Ellinger, I don't know what I can tell you, show you, or say otherwise to make you believe at this no, point. No, there are no more. There, there are no more no Shane Bouchel truthers out there. No, I would, I would hope not. Bandwagon. I would hope not. But I, and I, I kind of feel them because all of my, a lot of my big plays came in losses. Yeah, like my pick versus OU, my pick in the Big 12 title game, mm-hmm. uh, pick six. You and Sam do you know have that I mean? weird thing. They came in losses, right now, right? so I kind of feel them like it. And you can't, as a team guy, you know, you're not bring that up. I mean, no. I'm not gonna brag about that. It's like you lost. Dude. Yeah. What's the point? You can't brag about a game you had a great game and you lost. So <laughs> yeah, mellow. it's like yeah. So I feel him on that. But Sam, he's gonna have his moment. He's but he's he's, just, he's he's right now knocking on the door. You're right, uh, knocking on the door of greatness. No, and these are those things that if you're a movie script writer, you want to have because it only builds you up. Yeah. So then it's oh, like yeah. your Tebow crying moment. It that is. I'm never going to let him lose again. Yeah. So we'll see where it goes. And, and, and this game really, though, for anybody out there that maybe had any question marks about Texas or Sam, it sort of just verified what Sam said when he said we're back. And it was like you still – if Texas would have laid an egg in this LSU game, people would still have those questions. But this game – even though it's a loss, you have that type of feeling like, no, they're playing at a level that's at an elite level, which we haven't seen at Texas in almost a decade. So at that point, you know, Sam, he was right. He could sort of feel it when you're around those players without having any type of product, say, on the field. But now you're actually starting to see even more. Three things I want to touch on real quick before we get out of here. I thought the offensive line played very well. And I thought Sam Cosme and Parker Braun were freaking outstanding. Cosme in this made game. some money. Uh, Devin Duvernay, I, it speaks for itself, He's and, freak, and the physicality he ran with. I mean, going through a Dell pit on that one play was insane. Well, he twice, did it twice, by the way. Oh, twice. He did it twice. twice. <laughs> He's ran through one tackle, then ran over him. Oh, we're ran we're, over the we're seeing we're seeing the the absolute best of, of Devin Duvernay right now. I love that. And then I, I've heard that maybe internally it's being talked about, but I think Rochon Johnson to tailback Rod might need to be a permanent move. Yeah. As good as the upside might be I for him, a quarterback, I, I think it might be even better at running back. He just in that game for him to not and Tom Herman said it perfectly. He didn't flinch. Like he didn't look. 
intimidated. Didn't no. look like the moment was too big he for him. He actually ran. He, that, looked, he looked faster to the hole than Keontae Ingram. That he nineteen, more assertive. that totally nineteen play drive, that nineteen play drive, you you got started because Roshan Johnson gave you a couple of good physical runs on, on yeah. the at the beginning. He runs of that angry. Drive. I like him. And I then like he it. always gets that extra yard or two. Like it's that elusiveness where he's being tackled and then is still somehow able to squirm his body and contort it to the way that he can get a good mm-hmm. positive yardage. All right, so. Let's go ahead and make some picks. I'm sorry, folks. We're not going to break down rice because oh, no. there's – I watched a little bit of them Friday night. Had to change the channel after like one drive. It was up. Boring. I watched a little – Wake Forest. I, I did watch a little, I did watch a little bit of the Wake Forest game. I did watch a little bit of the Wake Forest game, and I ended up watching most of Marshall and Boise State. <laughs> Just sum them up in a couple of words. Uh, uh, Matt, right now, this line I saw at uh, 30 and a half. Uh, yeah, 31 <sighs> around there. What was the Louisiana Tech line? La Tech was 20 and a yeah, half. Yeah, 20 man? and a half. Damn. And this one, it this opened like And this is like basically at, it's not, it's, it's neutral field, but yeah. it's Rice. It's a Rice home game. It was game, a 32 basically. point wow. line, according to someone it opened. That's it's down crazy. to 31. Yeah. They're not worth breaking half. down. We're good. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know it was yeah. that bad. Uh, <laughs> we won't waste your time. I, I won't even this waste about the, Texas. I won't even yeah. waste the time with predictions. Rod, I'll start with you. Does, <laughs> does Texas cover, yes or no? <laughs> um, I. That's interesting. I don't know if they – yeah, they, they cover. Hell, yeah, they cover. What am I talking about? Yes, they cover. <laughs> uh, Casey Thompson gets in in, like, the third quarter, and, yeah, you see a lot of the young guys early on, so that's good for Texas. Yeah. And uh, I think you rest a ton of – you'll see a lot, a ton of guys that end up resting, like, hell, maybe even like a, a Caden Stearns and guys like that. Like, if you can get Sam Cosby out of that game pretty quick. Exactly. A guy like Zach Shackelford. Yes. Yeah. I agree. You know what I mean? Yeah, those second-team O-line can get some reps, that'd be fantastic. Yeah. Second team, the D line guys yeah. rotate those. The guys you're not still sure about, you just want to see them. I want to see Tavondre Sweat play a lot in this game. There you go. I want to see Jawan Mitchell in this game. Yeah, let me see those young corners. Hell, I, it, you know what? I see enough of your starting corners. And the let one, me see the guys behind the them. one hey, thing we can, can the, the one thing we can break down with this, the one thing All we can them. break down with oh, this Rod. Totos. The one thing you can break down, you will see more of Jawan Mitchell and Delia Dayway because Rice does run a pro style offense. Oh, that's true. Yeah, like when you list a fullback on your depth chart and only two receiver spots. Yeah, that gives you an indication of, of what kind of – and we know Mike Bloomgren coming from Stanford's a pro-style guy. So. This is true. Man, fullback. That's what Tom Herman said. It's a different animal. You won't really get to see a whole lot of those corners there being tested this week. You can see the, yeah, you can see the 3-4, the, the old 3-4 from Tartal Do nice. we see the, the F-backer? It, <laughs> it allegedly, it'll, the position allegedly exists. <laughs> yeah, that sounds hey, like a call, It's the F-backer, so feel yeah. sound like Like whatever it is <laughs> sounds filthy. Uh, oh. Matt, does Texas cover yes or no? Oh, man, I'm, if it drops below 30, which I expect it to because it's going that oh. way, then yeah. But I wouldn't bet it if it's over 30 right wow. now. Wow. You look at the public has 82% of bets on Texas, only 18% on Rice. Once you break that 80% threshold with the public, you don't want to be on that side. Uh. So let the numbers come down the if you want to bet Texas. Smart. It's going to keep on dropping down. Uh, be, right. Being in post game on Friday, or on Saturday, excuse me, that that team was pissed off. And it wasn't like what I, yeah, I, it yeah. wasn't like hurt mm-hmm. like you're depressed. It's like, no, we played like we played the number six team in the country down to the wire and could have won the damn game. They, yeah. They're they're pissed off. So they're mad at We're themselves. They're mad at the circumstance, situation. Everything. Like Malcolm Roach, Brandon, like the vets, like Good Malcolm Roach, Brandon Jones, Zach Shackelford. Those, those guys were pissed Sam off. Sam Ellinger's probably mad at himself a little bit. Good. Those guys are pissed off. I like that. And. Okay. It's kind of like you, you, I don't know if you guys remember like the dream team. Uh, oh yeah, you know, when, when the college kids the beat them. No, but when they played in the Olympics and they're oh, getting sorry. ready, they're, 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 they've got the their kids beat them at yeah, first. they've got their first press conference, and Charles Barkley says, I, "I don't know a lot about Angola, but I feel sorry for Angola. We're not breaking out rice, but." Yeah, I, I feel bad for Rice. <laughs> but that, was that the first game they played? Yeah, yeah. But I'll tell you, the, yeah. remember the oh no, the select lost. team. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah but that was because so the remember they brought the college kids, kids in, the college all stars in, the college all stars beat them in a scrimmage. Even though Mike Krzyzewski has and, and, and they, they, Chuck they yeah, the coaches the game, fixed yeah. the game because they thought they, the they thought the, the guys were too cocky. They're like, man, they're way too cocky, way yeah. too arrogant. We need to learn a lesson. Boom! This might be the lesson that Texas learned. Maybe you're a little arrogant, you know, going into that game. Yeah, I think Texas can come out really big and get up big, but also this is like a get healthy week where you don't it even is. want so that's why that's betting true. that line's a little risky on the back end. Okay. All right, Matt, thanks for everything, man. More than welcome. Rob B, appreciate the time in the next game. For everybody at the Austin Radio Network and the Travis, the best damn videographer in the podcast game. For everybody at the Austin Radio Network and the Horn, 104.9, 1019, AM 1260, streaming on the Horn app and the hornfm.com, where you can get Rod B on the Rodcast each and every weekday from 1 to 3. Shameless plug. 
Thanks to Matt, you can get us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, anywhere you get your podcasts. Don't forget to like us and leave us a review. And thanks to Matt, you can get all of our archives, classic interviews, classic shows on the Longhorn Blitz SoundCloud page. Yep, just type in Longhorn Blitz. For the Horn family, for the Horns 24-7 family, I'm Jeff Howe. Thank you so much for downloading and listening, and we will catch you again on the next episode. You've been listening to Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. Remember, for the latest Longhorn news 24-7, visit Horns247.com.